Hey everyone, this is Nick, and just because you're on holiday doesn't mean that you don't deserve your healthy dose of Linux and open source news. So here we go. This week we have VLC being banned in India for a few months now for a bogus reason that has nothing to do with the project itself. We have a report that the Pine64 community is slowly dwindling because of a weird decision the company made. And we have updates to the Linux stack, breaking Linux gaming and raising questions on the stability of the platform. And speaking of stability, how about you extend the life cycle of your PHP applications thanks to our sponsor. Thanks to Tuxcare for sponsoring this video. If you've ever worked on a project using PHP, you know how frustrating it is to know that the version you're using is going end of life and that you're gonna have to upgrade to it quickly with a bunch of refactoring and code rewrites. Well, Tuxcare can now help you to plan that transition thanks to their PHP extended lifecycle support. With that new service, you can keep your existing code base and still receive security updates and patches to PHP, even if it's no longer officially supported. This means that if your code base still meets your operational requirements, it can also still meet your security requirements and you get some more time to plan the transition. If you want to learn more about Tuxcare's PHP extended lifecycle support, you can click on the link in the description below. Something I just recently became aware of, but VLC seems to have been banned in India since February according to VLC's own stats. The reasoning seems to be that a China-backed hacker group called Cicada was using VLC to deploy malicious software. The ban was a soft ban without any announcement from the Indian government, but the result is still the same. Neither the VLC website or its download link are currently accessible. Of course, this only affects Windows and Mac users as VLC is available in most, if not all distros repositories. So everyone using Linux should still be able to install VLC from Flathub or from their distro directly. Still, this seems terribly counterproductive. Instead of letting users download the official, non-infected version of VLC, users now have to resort to try and download alternative versions that have a way higher chance of being infected. So basically, India is punishing VLC and its users because Windows security and software installation process suck. This is the best argument for app stores compared to the archaic hunt online and download and installer method. On an app store, you have a much, much lower chance of downloading an infected binary. GNOME developers have a new weekly update, and this time they gave a major performance improvement to Tracker Miners. Tracker being the indexing service that lets you perform system-wide search in GNOME Shell. Gnome Contacts got the ability to import and export contacts in the vCard format, something that was long overdue as it's pretty much the most basic feature for a contact manager. Calls, the phone dialer, can now send SMS from the call history, it's faster to open, and it has more fluid scrolling, so Linux phone users should all be happy, the whole 12 of them. Gnome JavaScript, the underlying engine that powers Gnome Shell, now is indexed on the latest Firefox engine with better API support. File Shredder is a new app that lets you completely delete files without any recovery possibility, and it's now part of Gnome Circle. News Flash, the RSS feed reader, can now handle code blocks highlighting, and Advita Manager got a new redesign. This program, if you don't know about it, is a tool that lets you customize LibAdvita apps and the Advaita GDK3 theme that mimics the new LibAdvita theme as well. It will also be renamed Gradients to avoid any confusion with official GNOME projects. I didn't know about Advaita Manager before making this video, but it looks absolutely amazing with Material U theming, accent colors and handling GDK3 and GDK4 apps. I will definitely give it a go soon. Speaking of LibAdvita, it looks like it won't be the announced disaster for distro theming that everyone thought it would be. Nautilus 43 has landed in the latest daily builds of Ubuntu 22.10, and this version uses LibAdvita, so one might expect it not to look at home next to Ubuntu's Yaru theme. Well, all that worry was apparently for nothing, as the app uses the user's accent color of choice, icons use the right theme, and the general window colors also seem to match the ones Yaru provides. So there is a way to ensure your distro can be coherent and use the same theme on all apps, which is good news for distro branding 
and probably less good news for developers who wanted distros to stop theming their applications. Libet Vita looks like it's been a huge success with most developers and GDK applications adopting it as they move to GDK4. And in my opinion, that's an amazing thing because it means that developers now have a very stable and very nice looking platform to develop their apps for. Glibc, so a minor update on bleeding edge distributions that broke easy anti-cheat support on Linux. If you don't know, Glibc is the GNU implementation of the C standard library and provides basically all the major APIs a ton of programs rely upon. While this breakage might not seem super important, it denotes a bigger problem with Linux as a platform. Our APIs and ABIs aren't stable and break things often. Other examples of this happening in the past was the transition to Pulse Audio, to System D, or from one version to GStreamer to another. This is a big problem for developers as it makes Linux look like something they shouldn't invest any time in supporting as there is no guarantee that things will work after the next update. This even prompted a Wine developer to say that the most stable ABI on Linux is actually Win32 and that this is why developers also prefer using Wine or Proton to get their games on Linux. Valve offered to help with this to have a stronger focus on compatibility. Whatever the conclusion you reach after hearing about this, this sucks. We do need stricter quality control process or at least we need to ensure that minor versions don't break things all the time. And that's also a pretty good argument for not using bleeding edge distributions if you do need a stable system. This week we also have an elementary OS update, although a small one. Elementary OS 6.1 got a new terminal update. They have reworked the way styles are handled, and so the terminal app can now follow the system style using Solarized Dark or the terminal full dark style. All default styles have also been updated to use the latest values from the upstream Solarized theme, and the default terminal has been made fully opaque to improve legibility. It's also possible to create your own custom color style, set background opacity, and more. As per Elementary OS 7, there is still no release date in sight, but the porting to GDK4 advances in the meantime, as the system settings are making solid progress. Elementary developers have also been working on designing responsive interfaces in their apps, changing the layout for both small, phone-like displays, or for large screen displays as well. I hope Elementary OS 7 will release before the end of the year, as we're already nearing Ubuntu 22.10 and Elementary OS 7 will be based on 22.04. I wouldn't want to see a repeat of the Elementary OS 6 situation, where when it released, it was using an already very outdated base. We also have some updates from the KDE team, as always. The major improvements is in terms of accessibility, as all Plasma widgets will now be compatible and usable with a screen reader. Samba shares permissions can now be managed remotely, and the Network Manager OpenConnect VPN plugin now supports the F5, Fortinet, and Array protocols. Kickoff, the main KDE menu, has a new compact mode that lets you see more items at a time, and that mode will be automatically disabled when entering touch mode. Global themes also now have the ability to change the order and arrangement of window buttons. Smaller improvements include Elisa being able to open files from relative path, Krunner placing results from the software center lower than already installed apps and settings, and the night color mode letting you choose your own manual location to automatically reduce blue light. Animations for the overview, present windows, and desktop grid also have a slightly longer animation with a better easing curve, so they should look a lot better and smoother. It's been a pretty big week, and Plasma 5.26 is shaping up to be an awesome, huge release, right on the back of 5.25, which was already pretty enormous. It's really cool. Now, this one is to be taken with a pinch of salt, as it's the account of one person who was involved with the Pine64 community and works on post-market OS, but it looks like the Pine64 is headed down a weird path. This company makes the PinePhone, PineBook, PineBook Pro, PineTab, PineTime, and other open ARM-based projects. And they've relied on the community for the software part, helping in any way they can with open hardware, schematics, and whatever they could provide. These efforts led to a vibrant ecosystem of distros and projects, notably on the PinePhone and PineBook Pro. 
The person who wrote the post states that the Pine64 seems to have decided to only collaborate with Manjaro for the future, even though the Ubuntu Touch community was the most prolific. Pine64 also decided to adopt some of their projects, like a bootloader that can't be replaced and is solely controlled by Manjaro. Solutions were offered to mitigate this, but were ultimately not implemented, and all of this seems to have resulted in development efforts dwindling over time, with the PinePhone Pro, PineNote, and other projects having almost no one to work on the software stack. Now, I don't know enough about the Pine64 and its project's inner workings to know if that's the personal feelings of that person or if that's a real issue. What's sure is that the Pine64 has been reliant on community efforts to make their hardware actually useful. And if they decided to only focus on one single distro, which historically hasn't been the one who contributed the most to these projects, I think it's a bad idea and I think it's gonna have negative impacts. Tuesday was GNOME's 25th birthday, and to celebrate the occasion, they released the beta of GNOME 43. I will obviously have a dedicated video in September once it releases, but the highlights include a redesigned main GNOME shell menu with quick toggles, more apps ported to GDK4 like GNOME Console, the terminal replacement, or the initial GNOME setup, support for dark mode in dconf editor, UI enhancements to GNOME software to display flatpak permissions, and major performance improvements to the GNOME text editor. Nautilus will see a ton of changes as well, like an adaptive design, a nicer and more responsive list view, a better properties window, sorting the recent items in the recent smart folder, improved search filters, and integration of a few plugins in the default experience, as well as the ability to format disks from the sidebar. We can also expect improvements to the window manager, Mutter, and to the shell itself with better on-screen keyboard, improved app grip navigation, and better overview animation performance. Some might say that these changes to Nautilus will finally make it into a real file manager, but honestly, it was already pretty freaking powerful, as demonstrated in the video that will appear somewhere in the card up top. Let's move on to some gaming news, as SteamOS will soon see a rebase. It might be based on Arch, but it's a fixed system. It doesn't see rolling updates like regular Arch. Currently, SteamOS uses the kernel version 5.13 and will soon move to 5.19, so we can probably expect a few libraries to get a version bump as well, and maybe the desktop mode will also see the latest version of KDE and its apps. Next, we have a new release of the Heroic Games launcher with GOG Cloud Safe support, a joystick overlay, support for the Epic overlay as well, and support for easy anti-cheat and battle-eye runtime. Adding wrappers and environment variables will also now be easier. There's a way to quickly add shortcuts to Steam, so your games can be added on a Steam Deck way more easily, and the UI got a lot of work as well. Proton 7.0-4 was also released, with a bunch of fixes for Elden Ring, Final Fantasy XIV, Assassin's Creed Origins, and video playback for a lot of titles, plus the usual bumps in DXVK and VKD3D versions. It's actually a pretty big update, and as usual, you don't have anything to do to benefit from it. And finally, we have Wine 7.15. This one supports command lists in Direct2D, RSA encryption, and also fixes 22 bugs, including for Call of Cthulhu, Grid Runner Revolution, Persona 4 Golden, The Settlers 5, The Witcher 3, and more. Good to see that SteamOS might have some updated internals. I was starting to worry that the desktop mode would be completely abandoned after the initial release, and what is the point of using an Arch-based system if you're not going to deliver frequent updates? You could have used anything else. Just like you could use a device that fully supports Linux, thanks to today's sponsor, Tuxedo. Tuxedo is a company based in Germany. They make laptops and desktops that do just that. They run Linux perfectly. They ship with Linux out of the box. You can pick from a selection of popular distros, but you can also install any distribution you want, and you know it's gonna work perfectly. And if there are a few tweaks needed here and there, they have PPAs and repos that you can add to your distro to fix the little issues that you might encounter, if any. But most of them never needed that, in my experience. 
Tuxedo offers a big range of devices. You have basically everything for every price point, every performance need, every use case, and they offer a wide variety of keyboard layouts and configuration options for each device. From the CPU, the GPU, the RAM, the SSD, additional hard drives, Blu-ray drives, extended support accessories, and even your own logo engraved on the lid of the laptop. So if you need a new device and you know you're gonna need to run Linux 100% on this thing, just head over to the link in the description below. Click it and get yourself a tuxedo device. They're really, really cool. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, you can also dislike it and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really enjoy the channel and you want to support what I do, you can click on the super thanks button underneath the video. You can click on the PayPal link in the description or you can become a Patreon member or a YouTube member. Both get access to a weekly podcast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.